Welcome to another edition of our treatment of the International Sunday School lesson. Today's lesson is entitled, A Necessary Faith, and it's taken from Hebrews, the 11th chapter, verses 1 through 8, and verses 13 through 16, and it's for August the 8th, 2021, summer quarter, lesson number 10. Now, a little background information. Today's lesson is, obviously, it's uh, focused on the book of Hebrews. And Hebrews, the uh, authorship of Hebrews is been debated and asserted for a lot of different people over the years. Our brother John Gill, he says that... Uh, it has been ascribed to different persons as to Barnabas, to Apollos, to Luke the Evangelist, and to Clement of Rome, but without any reason. Clement of Alexandria, a very ancient writer, asserts it to be the Apostle Paul. So, a wide range of people uh, have been asserted to be the human author, the human agent in the that wrote the book of Hebrews doesn't matter because Hebrews, as long as we're accepting and understand that Hebrews is part of the canon and a um, is an inspired word of God, which we do. The other thing, too, that as far as background uh, discussion that I want to bring up is the definition of faith. You see, in the Bible, there are two aspects of how faith is used. One of them is a passive, and one of them is an active kind of definition of what is faith. Um, we have one aspect of the word faith as it's used, meaning uh, fidelity, trustworthiness, uh, someone is Faithful has faithfulness. You can depend on them, and that is one aspect of faith. And the other aspect of faith is the feeling, trusting, uh, believing in someone, having confidence in someone, uh, and which is another aspect of how the word faith is used. Okay? Hebrews 11, 1 and 2. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. Now, we could go on and, and discuss this uh, for weeks about how, what this really means because faith is so important in the uh, Christian uh, experience. But it's important for us to realize that even all the way back into the Old Testament, and this is what the writer of Hebrews is going to bring out here in a little bit, that even in the Old Testament, people would have faith and there was evidence in the way they acted that they believed that the Lord was going to come through for them, that they could have confidence in what the Lord told them and that they had assurance of what the Lord told them. And also, too, their actions give you assurance that they have faith. So it's really like a two-way street uh, that is going on here. Okay? Okay, Hebrews 11 and 3. By faith we understand that the universe was formed by God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. And that's important for us to, when we're thinking about how powerful 
God is. That's important for us to understand this, that God was standing there in the nothingness and spoke the entire universe into existence. And it was from his power, his energy, that he created all the matter in the universe. It is incomprehensible the amount of energy, the amount of power it took to create the entire universe. Everybody has seen that famous equation, E equals MC squared. That is the relationship between energy and mass. And it's the amount of energy equals the amount of mass in the conversion times the speed of light squared. And it has been estimated that when the atomic bomb went off in Hiroshima in Nagasaki, that it was only ounces of matter that was converted into energy. And we see how much energy that was that um, the amount of energy that was in those bombs was stunning. And yet it was only just a couple of ounces of matter. And God, going the other way, took his power and created matter out of the nothingness. And that is how much power he used to do that. So when we are thinking about trying to limit what God is able to do, <laughs> we need to keep that in mind. How much power is does the Almighty really have? And it is incomprehensible to the human mind how powerful God really, truly is. Hebrews 11 and 4. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks even though he is dead. So we think back to the story of Cain and Abel, how that Abel had brought a blood sacrifice uh, before the Lord and Cain did not, and how the jealousy uh, went welled up inside of Cain and how Abel had faith and trust in the Lord and believed in what the way the Lord had instructed them to do. And so Abel was commended as righteous and God commended his offerings. And it was his testimony that went on after he was dead that this is talking about. It's by Abel's faith that his testimony kept speaking when God was talking to Cain and says, your brother is blood is pleading from the ground. And it was his faith, his testimony that went on after he was dead. Hebrews, the 11th chapter, verses five. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And we read the quick story of Enoch in the book of Genesis, how that Enoch walked, lived a righteous life, had communion and fellowship with God, and God 
took Enoch and more or less translated him just like uh, the prophet in the Old Testament and was whisked away. Now, I don't want to get into a lot of discussion about whether or not Enoch is one of the uh, two witnesses in the book of Revelations or anything like that because, you know, I, I don't really have a um, definitive opinion about that. Uh, don't really uh, too much concern myself with that aspect because I'm planning on uh, being uh, with Jesus when all that's going on because of the great resurrection the, and the rapture of the church. Uh, but the... Uh, but the thing about it is this is, is that Enoch gave a great testimony because he had faith and confidence in the Lord. And it was that faith and confidence and faithfulness to the Lord that Enoch demonstrated that um, gave him that extreme privilege of being translated um, in the garden that day. Okay. Hebrews 11 and 6. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Now, this is something that is critical for us to understand. And it's heartbreaking in a lot of respects, for me, this reality, because I have known people that I found to be good, moral people that I care a lot about who are atheists. But let me tell you something. You cannot be an atheist and be saved at the same time. And the reason being is, is that you have to believe that God exists to be accepted by him. It is impossible to deny the existence of God and to be accepted in the kingdom. It is impossible possible. That is why it is so critical for us to uh, have integrity in this world to where we do not damage our testimony. That is why it's so critical for us to uh, think things through when we say it so that we're not being just totally ignorant and illogical when we say things so that we don't bring discredit on Christianity and the Christian message. That is why we should assert and defend the faith at every opportunity and to do it in a, in a spirit of love and compassion and prayerfulness because the people out there, if they do not believe in the existence of God, at the end of the day, they are going to go to hell. And it's, it's, it's a horrifying place. And it, faith is essential. It is the most essential aspect of salvation is faith. Okay? Hebrews 11 and 7. By faith Noah, when warned about things not seen in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By faith he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. Now stop and think about Noah. There he was in an ungodly, ungodly time. People were in total rebellion against God. And there he was with his little family. And God tells him 
that he is going to send a flood. Now, it hadn't really even rained good on the earth. It, the, the, the land was being watered by a mist. It hadn't really even rained well on the earth. And Noah was told to build an ark. And he probably hadn't even seen a boat. And so God gave him the instructions to build this ark because he's going to send a flood. And Noah executed what God had told him to do. And if you looked at it in the natural, it was the most silliest thing in the world for Noah to be doing this. Because there he is. It hadn't even come a good rain before. And nobody had seen a flood. And he is building this huge boat for his family and all the land animals to get on. And that defies description as far as what people would think about Noah and how he looked so silly and so foolish while he was doing that up until the moment that it started to rain. And when it started to rain, you can bet those people were having second thoughts. But once the door was closed, it was too late. And let me tell you something. Those of us that believe in the rapture, that preach the, the coming rapture of the church before the great tribulation, we sound so silly to some of these people. And they look at us like we are complete idiots. And it's going to look that way to them up until the moment that all these people vanish. And we'll be gone in the twinkling of an eye. And it's too late then. Same way with people that, that die in their sins. I mean, I have seen lost people who were so hard-hearted and so hardened to the gospel that they would mock Christians and mock living right and mock the end the end place that people end up at after death and mock it all and act like they're going to have a big party in hell. They're not going to be any party in hell. Let me tell you something. There is darkness, loneliness, pain, torment in hell. It is not a place where you're going to have a party. Okay? The only place there's going to be any joy in the afterlife is in heaven. And you got to have faith that that's the way things are going to work out to be able to accept it. Okay? Hebrews 11 and 8. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. Now, it's important for us to really get a grasp of how much faith Abraham demonstrated. Here he was in Ur of the Chaldees. He was an idolater, and God calls him. And he puts faith in the Lord God Almighty. And he leaves his home and heads down 
to this occupied territory. And God promises him that he is going to get all of this property. And he has been married all this time. All this time doesn't have any children. And it doesn't look like he's going to ever get any children. And God promises him that his seed is going to be as numerous as the stars of heaven. And Abraham accepts God's promise and carries on believing God's promise. You can see his actions. I mean, he even planted a tree in the promised land that he didn't own any of the property on. And he planted a tree knowing that one day his great-grandchildren would actually get to enjoy that tree. Okay. Hebrews 11, 13 through 16. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would not have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Oh, man. Think about that. This is the life of a Christian. We are pilgrims and strangers here below. We're not of this world. Our hopes and affections are on heaven. It is looking toward that better day, that better place, that final resting place, that place where we'll be in fellowship with God, we'll be fellowship with God's Son, Jesus Christ, we'll be in fellowship with all of the saints of God, we'll be in fellowship with all the people that we've, uh, all the Christian people we've known here below, and we're heading toward that better place. And these Old Testament saints, they demonstrated that same thing in their life. Like I said uh, earlier, Abraham planted a tree that he would never get any of the benefit from it. His son Isaac would never get any benefit from it. And maybe even his son, grandson Jacob and Esau would never get any benefit from it. But their children would. It would be available to them to produce goods for them. And that is the kind of thing that generational faith that we're talking about here. Where they believed God was going to come through for them. Okay? Now, in conclusion, I'm going to keep the conclusion really blunt and direct today. A couple of things, just two things. First off, believe God. Have trust in Him. Believe in Him with everything in you. Believe in God. The second thing is be faithful to God. Let your actions demonstrate that you have faith 
in God. Okay? Well, friends, good Lord willing, I'll be back with you next weekend.